and also to the church. But the problem is that in order to please bishops, in order to please bishops, people change. And you are now, you now become what you are not. And it becomes a problem. So please um, don't change. Shakespeare tells us to yourself be true. So you cannot be false to any man. If you are this way inclined, let the bishop know. Uh, well, the shock I had was when I went to CKC. And um, it was a very evangelical parish. And when I got there, I first spent a few months or weeks thinking that, what am I looking for in this place? And um, one day I preached a sermon that Baba heard about. And later he asked me, that I understand you have been asking, what are you doing in CKC? I know it was a rhetorical question when I was preaching, but I'm happy you have heard. So I can now ask that question properly. Your Grace, what exactly do you want me to do in that place? Because I don't worship the way they worship. And he said to me, he said, well, go there and help me set a standard. Help me set a standard. I said, well, if that's what you want, by God's grace, I will do so. And today, if when people ask me, which is the church I enjoy the most? It is CKC. Because for me, those people were the sincerest people. If they say it's good morning, it's good morning. If they say it's good night, it's good night. If they say, whatever they say is how you meet them. It was the best. I enjoyed our lawyer because somebody here is looking at me. <laughs> I enjoyed our lawyer too. Yes, because that is my family church. But CKC was the best. They didn't have, but they're the most generous people by their friendship and their sincerity. So he said, set a standard. And that is linked to what I want to say next, which is self-improvement. You have to improve yourself. I was sharing with the Bishop of Badagri just now that when I was sent to Adoloya, I, I honestly was looking for ways to get out of it. Because in Adoloya, I, couldn't, I knew it was a Yoruba church. And I couldn't speak Yoruba. I couldn't even pray in Yoruba. And also, at that time, I was not married. And because a Yoruba church, traditional church, I didn't think they would accept a bachelor as their vicar. But Baba Adetloye understood the church history even more than what I knew at that time. And he was convinced that Aroloya would never close his doors against me. So I went. I didn't understand Yoruba, and I told them, well, I will teach you English, you will teach me Yoruba. And they said to me, you are not serious. Allah Kori, who told you we don't speak uh, English? But what I'm trying to say is that I would never, if you come, if you see my Yoruba prayer book, I would sit down in my spare moment, put Yoruba and put uh, English side by side and read, understand, so that I memorize the English, so that in using the Yoruba, I could actually, since I knew the English, I could actually understand the a, uh, the da, the whatever it was that was going on. So over there, I decided to improve myself that I would understand this thing. And so if now people sing one of the hymns, when I sing hymns from memory, for instance, like IOM 12, IOM uh, 309, you ask, people ask me, but you said you don't understand Yoruba. I said you couldn't have served in Aroloya without. I made it a point of duty. And in those days, if I didn't read a lesson, I would never read it in front of the church. I won't read it. And my teacher, of course, was my curate, the only curate I had, Baba Fatusi. And when we get into the vestry, I say, Baba, oh yeah, this one, Balashimakpe, how do we call this one? How do you pronounce this one? So we must improve ourselves. We must read, we must study. And as uh, Paul tells Timothy, Show your study to show yourself approved unto God. When we stop learning, the usual thing is that we start to die. You cannot remain static. 
And the good thing too is that nowadays the church encourages clergy to study. In our own time, when we first started, it was almost as if it wasn't allowed. I remember that in Emmanuel College, those of us, uh, some of us wanted to continue in Emmanuel College from year one, year two, the year three, you do the, um, you join UI and do the degree course. At a point in time, the Supra West told all those who had joined the degree course, who were regular students, that they must leave. That they must come out and do their, have their ordination, that they were sent there to train. And of course, there were stories at that time that there were some priests who left and their bishops didn't allow them to go and study. Many of you who remember Baba De Chiloe, we remember, but with Baba De Chiloe, it was different. If you go to him and you go and study, you come back to Baba De Chiloe and say, Sir, I got my BA degree. He will tell you, begin again. If you go and say, I got my MA, he will say, more ahead. With Baba De Chiloe, the changes started coming in. And so we are happy that now even more uh, opportunities of education is available. So nobody has an excuse. You have that opportunity, whether it's uh, Abel Kutao, whether it is um, the one in Oyo, go to university and go and study and improve yourself, especially in the areas of the interests of your uh, calling. The challenge of the pews becoming higher than the pulpit is very real. Your messages in terms of content and delivery must constantly improve. Your conduct of worship, the way you dress, the way you speak, your movement in worship, your comportment must always be of acceptable standard. You must take seriously, sorry, we must all take seriously our sermon preparation, which Sermons must be original, both in content and in the style of de delivery. There's no way to try to copy any person. No, we no need to. Be yourself. Preach the way God has asked you to preach. Speak the way God has asked you to speak. And we must constantly develop ourselves. You must be yourself. The other one now is being um, aware of greed and selfishness. Ecclesiastes 5.10 Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Greed and selfishness has killed many ministers and priests and ministries. It hinders sustainable ministry, especially if that is the focus of our ministry. And we must be very, very careful. Sometimes money, if we put money at the beginning of everything, it is a problem. Um, sorry, Venerable Mason, it's not because you are sitting in front. But when we served together in Marina, no, no, when we served together in Marina, especially when we had weddings, sometimes the father of the bride will come into the vestry before the service and say, ah, uh, provost, I want to give you on behalf of all the clergy. And I will say to him, I will say to them, please don't give us any money. Hold your money. We don't need the money. If after the service, you feel that the service has been a blessing, then you can come back. But not before. And there was a reason why. Because very quickly, they can easily say, ah, those priests, if you don't give them, they won't do their work. And I see it pays, because whatever you are going to get, you are going to get. There was a wedding we did. Uh, he was there that time. At least after the wedding, he changed his car. <laughs> then he was not a priest in the cathedral. All of us clergymen who did that wedding that day, all of us became millionaires. And the money we got it, maybe two, three weeks after the wedding. All of us. So, what is yours will become your own. Don't put money first. And be careful with money. 
Money is as good as it is, it's a terrible thing. It can destroy. The other thing is vicar and curates, which is always an ongoing thing. There are too many instances of vicars who refuse to share with curates or younger priests, asking them to do what? Wait for your time. And I use myself as an example to my clergymen in the Diocese of Lagos, Milan. At a point in time, I served under a priest. And later, I became his bishop. So be careful. Because you never know what is going to happen. Be careful. So if he had been keeping what belongs to me when he was my vicar, when I became the bishop, humanly speaking, what should I have done to him? <laughs> hey. huh? uh, humanly speaking, I should show him Pepe. Yes. Be careful. Again, when I was transferred from the church, he didn't announce my transfer. But at the end of the day, I became his bishop. You don't know where you are going to meet yourselves. So let us be careful. When you say, wait for your turn. And then, later on, that same curate now becomes your vicar. Then what complaints do you want to have? The person you cheat today might be your superior tomorrow. Justice, fairness, and equity in our relationships should be our standard. Now, in a way, this talks about relationships between vicars and uh, curates, or curates and vicars. At the same time, too, some curates can be terrible. I understand that. Some curates are incorrigible. There's nothing you do that they can be satisfied with. And I've had that experience very well. Uh, but now I can't say it. But it's a very good uh, story to tell. Now, when we say develop good relationships, this involves with your, with your clergymen and with the congregation. You must be deliberate about this to make good efforts to ensure that there's a cordial relationship between you and your clergymen and brothers and the congregation you are leading. If you are a very terrible person and you fight everybody, especially fighting members of the congregation, the bishop will just tell you that I don't think you can continue there. In, a re in recent times, we have had issues where uh, the, between the vicar and the priests in a particular church. And at the end of the day, I had to call the priest one day. Do you have another job? He said, no. I said, I myself, I don't have another job. It's only this one I know. I've started this one since I was 25. I said, I don't have another place. You see these people in the church, if they are not there, we are irrelevant. We are irrelevant. So do everything possible to keep them. Don't use bad behavior to scatter the sheep of God because you are the shepherd. So good relationships between interpersonal relationships between ourselves, whether clergymen and, and then also with lay people. It doesn't mean there won't be disagreements. There can be disagreements. In fact, there will be disagreements. But we must find a way to overcome. So that is very, very important. I tell clergymen, if you are fighting a battle in a church, if you are on the right side, if you are on the right side of the argument, I will support you. I will support you. And then one of my senior pastors was having an issue in a church where he was. I asked him what was going on and he told me it had to do with whether youth church 
or adult church. And that is part of the problem. How can you have two churches in a church? But unknown to the vicar, that priest at that time, there was somebody in that church who was very close to me. So he used to give me the correct thing that was going on. Now, the leader of the people fighting the priest was very close to that person. So everything those people wanted to do, that, that person would come and tell me. The moment they decided they are going to seek an audience with the bishop, that person had told me, even before the vicar came and to tell me. So I knew what was going on and I knew where to go to. So as soon as they came, they sat down and I, I said, will you have something? They said, no. They started talking. I allowed them to talk and usually I'm not very patient, I confess. But this time, I allowed everybody to talk. Then I asked the first person, I said, my brother, how old are you? He said, 55. I said, you see where the problem lies? You, uncle, how old are you? Eh, I'm just about 60. Ah. I said, do you know what the constitution says? Youth is 40 below. So what are you doing in the youth? Uh, let's not even call church. Let's, what are you doing in the, with the youth? Come and take your place in the main church. And if you don't want to take your place in the main church, then you can go elsewhere. But don't come and scatter this place. And that was how the matter was resolved. Because they that realized they couldn't get another traction. They couldn't get any traction with it. And I supported the vicar. That is a fight worth fighting. If it is something that is good for the church, because, again, he was there. I fought many battles too. Whether in Aroloya, but even in Marina. It was only in CKC there was nothing to fight. That's one of the reasons why I love the place. Nothing at all. So, um, we have to, we have to develop these good relationships with our people. But most importantly, we have to put on humility. Decrease, I did this, I did this, I did this, and follow the example of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Humility. Humility is such a good thing because it is what Jesus, if Jesus were some of us, he will never agree to leave the glory above and come down and become a man. If it were some of us. And I used to wonder, what was in all of this thing, self? What is in it? Nothing. Everything will end. By God's grace, when you are 70, that's the end. It's finished. By God's grace, when you are 70, it is it. So now I'm even counting, I'm beginning to count down. Whether I like it or not. I'm, uh, by God's grace, uh, by May this year, I will have 11 more years to go. I'm beginning to count. And now when I was coming from the car, that is for me, oh, I'm not saying for another person, no. When I was coming from the car, so many people wanted to carry my bag. I will tell them that if you give me, if I give you my bag, I won't, I won't be balanced. It's a way for me not to allow Lord Bishop to enter my head. Because I'm a chief servant. So, humility doesn't, you know, the Bible Magnificat says, the Magnificat, he says that he raises the humble and he brings down the proud. So, in our interaction, although when I started in 1990, many people thought that I was very proud. I'm a provost, they call. He's very proud. He's very this. But what they didn't understand was that the difference between pride and shyness is a very small prism. I find it difficult to make friends. So people assumed, therefore, that he's a very proud person. It was my friend, Venerable Ben, who was telling them, you don't, you don't know Kwelu. You don't know him. If you know him, you know that he's the least proud person. I was, what is in life? Nothing. If it is Kasok, I grew up watching Kasok. My father went Kasok. So there's nothing to this thing. 
Let's humble ourselves. Let's make ourselves accessible. Make ourselves accessible to our people. Vicars. In the Diocese of Lagos mainland, we have some Lord Vicars. Yes, I call them Lord Vicars. If you see them, please uh, tell them. I ask them if they are Lord Vicars. Because they have more power than the bishop. In the way they talk to the congregation, in the way they treat their congregation, they have more power than myself. And I keep asking them, but do I talk to you that way? Do I deal with you that way? Why do you talk like that to your congregation? Because they will come back and come and tell me. So please, let us be courteous. Let us bring ourselves down. I know that when you are humble sometimes, to tell. let me tell you a quick one. Our lawyer. In our lawyer, there are two stories. Um, of course, Baba Fatusi was older than me, definitely, with white hair. So one day, we were standing in the compound, and I was just wearing polo shirts and uh, jeans. And his office was before the house. The house was at the bungalow that time, was at the end of the compound. So as we stood there, one lady came into the church compound. And the lady, I greeted her, but she totally ignored me. So she greeted Baba, knelt down for Baba Fatusi. So what I did was I just walked away. I didn't pay attention. I just walked away. But I could hear what they were saying. I gave them time to talk. So she narrated everything she wanted. So Baba Fatusi now said to her, unfortunately for you, ma, everything you have said, I have heard. But the only person who can say yes or no is that person that you refuse to greet. That that person is the vicar of the church. So the woman almost entered the ground. But for me, it was okay. I didn't get, I didn't get angry with her because I could understand, I could understand her, where she was coming from. In the same way too, a member of the church, that same Aralea, was given a chieftaincy title by Obao Yekon. So we went. But he had warned me that Obao Yekon, he had insisted that his vicar must say a prayer. So myself and Baba Fatusi were seated. When the palace um, messenger or somebody came, they called Baba Fatusi that, oh yeah, uh, come and do prayer. So Baba said, Baba said, no, I said, Baba, please go. It is you the Holy Spirit has taken. Me, I was wondering in my head, which kind of prayer do I want to say in the palace in Yoruba? <laughs> so I was so happy. But... Don't forget, I think that person had told Kabiesi who his vicar was. So when Baba Fatusi got there and started the prayer, Kabiesi kept on looking at him. You put that. You will look at him again. Where I was, I was just watching the drama. I was laughing. So after the whole thing, the person now took me to Kabiesi to introduce me to Kabiesi. That Kabiesi, uh, vicar, this is our vicar. So Kabiesi said to me, eh I was wondering when that man was praying. So, but for me, my own prayer was answered. If you want to do it, do it. You see, and I used to tell the clergy in Marina, at the end of the day, it will stop on my table. Whatever you want to do, it will stop on my table. So, take it easy. Take it easy. My mentality is, I won't be the first. I'm not the first, and I won't be the last. I wasn't the first bishop of Lagos mainland, and I will never be the last. If anything happens to me today, that night, ah, my brothers would have been saying that, you hey, know, they'll start making calls. That is life. It is, it is the reality of life. So I don't make any... Uh, no, 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 no. It's because you are here. So let us, hum let us be humble in how we relate to each other. And we will find that it pays at the end of the day. All of these things, perhaps we can even sum them up in what we we'll call character. Remember, all of us are involved in this. A good character helps sustain the priest in his ministry and helps convince people of the sincerity 
of the priest, even of his calling. Even of his calling. Because I'm sure some of you have heard it being said of other people. Are you sure this person is a priest? Are you sure this person is what he says he is? Are you sure this person was called? I can't, everybody has his own call. Everybody knows how God called him, how God, those who had a dream, those who had this, and all that. Even I myself, I feel guilty because people can easily say that um, he wasn't called, he was just following in the footsteps of his father. You know, so I'm not going to judge anybody on whether they were called, they were not called. Because at the end of the day, all of us are going to stand where? Before the judgment seat of Christ. So it's not for me to judge. What I am saying here, some of it convicts me myself. And that is how it should be with the sermons we preach. Each of us shall be convicted. So a good character helps to sustain the ministry uh, of a priest and helps convince people of the sincerity of a priest. From Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 2, 20 to 32. If we read it from verse 20 to 32, Ephesians chapter 4. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. In accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds. Attitudes of your minds. Maybe that is where the problem is. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 20 to 32. If you read it up until 32, you will see it. Are you honest or am I honest? Am I a straightforward person? If I say I'm going to, um, where should I say I'm going to now? At the end of the day, will I find myself there? Can you be trusted with money? Are you easily angered? There are the three W's. Uh, women, wine, and wealth, which they say we must run from. How are we with the three W's? All these um, issues are fundamental to the success. Now, I personally don't like to use the word success because success will be judged um, when it's a relative term. I prefer the word faithful. Because in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. It also say success. And the world judges success by what you have, by the cars, by the houses you are able to build, by the schools you are able to attend, by the way you are able to dress. But the question is, are you faithful? Have you been faithful to God? And there was something I was thinking about that I forgot to put in. And we concerns faithfulness to God. It, is, it has to do with what is going on in the social media. Many of us have sold our souls in order to attain success. We have involved ourselves with other things. It is likely that we have involved ourselves with other things in order to be successful. In English, there's a word, they call it necromancy. Necro eh? yeah, who is familiar with the word? Necromancy. You make a deal with the devil. You tell the devil that I will serve you for 20 years. You just make me as rich as I want to be. And the devil will, do, will help you. He will multiply everything you want. But when that 20 years are up, you can't escape it. You must enter, and the devil is a very powerful, he will prolong your life beyond that 20 years for you. So that when it is time to serve him, then you will serve him. I think there was a play, it's called Dr. Faustus um, in literature. And you see um, necromancy there. So please, um, let us look at it. It is a faithful ministry, not a successful ministry. 
Good character traits are pleasing to the one who has called us and are critical to having a sustainable ministry. Whether whatever we are character-wise will be discerned by those we minister to. And this is an area we must all prayerfully work on to improve. Some of us might be weak in one area or the other. This is an opportunity for us to reflect on this and see how we can improve. And finally, well, not finally, because by your contributions, there might be other points. But finally, from this point of view, at least from this place, a good and constantly improving prayer life. Notice, a good and constantly improving prayer life anchors our ministry on the one who has called us to his service. So it is Jesus, by our constant prayer, which improves, which is supposed to improve, it helps to anchor our ministry on him. It is he alone who gives the wisdom, discernment, and all that is necessary for the sustainability of our ministry. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Scripture tells us that ministry is never smooth sailing. From the evangelicals of the 18th um, century, people like John Wells, Wesley and co, they will tell you of, you will hear about what they call the dark nights of the soul. The times when things are dark, as if there's no way forward. But with prayer, everything becomes clear. And we will have problem. There's no way. When I tell clergy, I learned something from Baba Ademowo. And those of us from Lagos who served under him, if you can remember. If there's a problem with a priest, he will set up a panel. But the panel will never include lay people. And if I need to do that, I would always set up a panel with, lay people, uh, with um, clergymen. I remember when I first got there, somebody, uh, somebody from a church called me. Uh, Bishop, we understand that you have set up a panel and there are no lay people there to, to join the panel. I said, yes. He's been, it's a fact-finding mission. If we need to constitute an ecclesiastical court, that will be determined. The constitution specifies those who will be. The chairman of such a court is the chancellor of the diocese. I said, but for now, the clergy will be investigated only by their fellow clergymen. And when clergymen, I ask them to face panel or whatever, for their own good, to help them sometimes, they always, uh, they will say to me, hey, but Bishop, I said, listen, Dake, I too, I have faced panel. I have faced a panel before. As provost, I faced a panel. So I said, nothing, it just gives you an opportunity to say your own. I said, look at it from that point of view. So please, ministry is not smooth saying, take it from me, you know. But we should continue with, with prayers without ceasing. Those prayers without ceasing assist us to remain faithful to the end. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Please sit down, please. Uh, if you have any questions, Abi. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, my lord. I think we can do better. Let us appreciate. We want to appreciate my Lord. We should appreciate the simplicity of this paper and the presentations. That shows the simplicity of the presenter, just as the Holy Spirit, in a simple way, we always help us to sustain our ministry. Baba, we appreciate you, sir. Praise the Lord. We only allow only three questions from us because of our time. Three questions. The first three uh, people to raise up their hands. Questions? 
Thank you very much. We don't want any contributions. Go and read the paper. The paper is so simple and the presentation is so simple. So let's go through it at our end and uh, we will learn more. Shall we put hands up for the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, but thank you, sir. We want to invite one of our fathers in the house, the Venerable Israel Omotunde Owoyele, to come and help us express our gratitude to the chairman of this session and also our facilitator, Papa Owoyele. My Lord, the Dean, and my dear brothers, you will all agree with me that uh, our Father in the Lord, the presenter of this lecture, Right Reverend B.C. Akinpelu Johnson, has made a very down-to-heart presentation. The lecture was somehow um, communicating to us in the right perspective without struggling. So, the Lord Bishop, I want to thank you very much for this presentation. It's a prayer that God will continue to strengthen you, increase you, and the grace of God upon you will not fade away. And thank you for being who you are. We appreciate you. And of course, the chairman of the session, uh, the dean of uh, the Diocese of Badagri, St. Thomas, uh, is in Badagri Diocese too. So we appreciate you, Papa Ilegusi. Thank you very much. The Lord bless you. Thank you. Standing up. This is 104, but we want to move on with the next session, which is let us reason together. And to lead us in the reasoning is a faculty member, an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at University of Lagos. The Reverend Dr. Karo Obenaka. My Lord, the Dean of the Faculty and our revered Bishop of Lagos Mainland, our fathers in God, good afternoon to every one of us here. Let me, first of all, sincerely thank every one of us for the patience and for the orderliness. Um, I believe this is a very important session that we should look at. It's supposed to be for 30 minutes, 
But because we are on time, we're going to have some added 10 minutes or so. We've taken a lot of lectures, and I want to believe we've internalized most of these lectures. In a way, we could put them into perspective, quantitative growing of the church and qualitative growing of the church. Now, in this session of reasoning together, I want us to address a few questions that are very practical and that can be some form of take home for us as clergymen. Number one, what are the things you are doing in your parish that you can share with us that you think sincerely is growing your church, your parish? What are the things you think you are doing or you've noticed are impediments to church growth? The third one is, what are the possible better ways we can do what we are doing now? Uh, I know we have opinions, we have uh, suggestions and things, but let us be practical so that we can share in our ministry and see how we can help one another. Because your parish today may become the parish of another person tomorrow. And a little bit of openness will help us in our ministry. But I want to believe that generally, people tend to say, even in big churches, well, what we call big churches, you see our fathers in God complaining that their prayers have worked so much, worked so well that their parishioners have left Ikeja for Banana Highland. And so they are losing members to bigger places, all to the glory of God. But we still know that there is no vacancy. There is no emptiness in nature. People, as people are moving out from one place, people are migrating to new places. And there is also room for conversion. And so please, if you have any opinion on this, we'll be glad to receive comments and suggestions from you. Thank you, sir. Yes, who will break the ice? I'll move around. You introduce yourself and thank you very much. My name is Kola Laiwola. Dr. Tony Okewo came to speak to us that the church today has to become a business concern. And except we have people who are business-minded and see it as business-minded. With the dynamics of the current situation in town, the world becoming one place, and except we look at the two people who spoke to us about evangelism, there is a model in this cathedral, the Lost Laborers Fellowship, that we take people from the streets, train them, empower them to be able to retain them. And if we don't look at it like that, the world has changed to what the world was when Christianity came. So this is a business concern. 
And I'm happy that it is the seminary that is organizing this. What are the marketing strategies that the seminary has to put into our heads, into our minds, to make us look at the church as a business concern? Noted. Any other person? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm Sonny Oladsonji Okoye Kun. I've been meaning to speak from yesterday about the, the theme for our workshop, which is growing the church. And um, I was talking to some of my colleagues of my, my concerns about how we um, respond to this as, as clergy and especially as Anglicans. Now, of course, let me give you an example of what I saw um, in November during my leave visiting the cathedral here and also Bola Memorial and also in comparison with um, Dorothy Koku Memorial Anglican Church where my family um, belongs. I went to Bola Memorial for a seven o'clock service and the youth chapel only had the chaplain and then just one, one youth. I came to Agbushovainen Youth Chapel and the place was packed. And I thought to myself, how, how can we truly be united as the church? And for those of us who are Atchikins, I've spoken to one of us yesterday. And one of the things I learned from a church planting school that I got a certificate in evangelism and pastoral ministry is about revitalization. I think we need to th perhaps think about that, revitalization of our churches. And how can we do that? One of the, one of the models that I've observed um, in the last decade is um, an Anglican clergyman who is retired now uh, is the Reverend Nikki Gombo. Nikki Gombo pioneered the Alpha Course in one of the largest churches in, in England, Holy Trinity Brompton. And I remember watching very closely how Holy Trinity saw one of their parishes, Onslow Square, that was literally, the, the church was just literally just dying. And they asked the congregation um, at Holy Trinity Brompton if there were 200 people who could go and help to revitalize the church. Now, I know that might be a bit testing for the dean um, <laughs> and for many of our bishops, but we need to look at this very closely because we cannot have an Atchikinri seat growing in numbers and then one of the churches in the Atchikinri seat um, dying. So we all need to be united as a church, and I, and I pray that we would perhaps learn ways of doing that effectively. And I'll just close with just two other aspects when it comes to growing the church. Our bapt how we take our baptisms and our confirmation classes. These are ways of which we can truly um, help our people to understand how important, and I, my, my bishop in Lagos mainland, um, he emphasizes that muchly. And, it, and in the last two synods, we've looked at baptism. Last year, we looked at the youths. We need to enable, I love what one of, our, um, one of the speakers says about um, being liturgical and evangelical. Our liturgy is so beautiful. I agree with him. It's so beautiful. It's about how we um, revive those words and enable our people to truly benefit and, and enjoy it. And I pray that we'll do that and learn more in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I just hope, please, by the time we are through, I should be able to have at least seven steps I can take to increase my congregation from 100 member congregation to 500. Seven steps. 
All right, sir. I'll come this way. Thank you very much. I disagree with the speaker who said that the church should be treated as a, as a business. The church is not a business. It is a community. And in every community or wherever you have communities, you'll have poor communities and you have rich ones. So each community has specific requirements. And when you look at the, what the last speaker said, that is the bishop of the, the, bishop of the mainland diocese, he said that God requires faithfulness and not success. There was once a priest who said he had a touch of uh, Midas. I don't know why he didn't say the touch of Abraham. Because Midas is a pagan god. And uh, when you consider this and consider what the last speaker said, we are becoming more or less like the world which we are meant to run away from, which we are meant to, to flee from. When you look at the early history of the church, the church fathers who were known as the desert fathers, ran away from the city to the desert because they were running away from the world and they were running away from money. But yet, as they ran away from money, money followed them. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And so what I'm saying here and I'm being specific about is that we have to study each community and then uh, understand the requirements and the needs of those communities and address them. By the time we do that, then we'll have no problem with the population of our congregation. Thank you. Please, the next speaker, our father, will soon be around. But let me put it simple. It is so easy to do evaluation and analysis. But having done that, we'll find problems. Recommendation. That is where we are now. What are our recommendations? We'll take just two briefly and... Thank you very much. I am Rock Odeka. I still want to stand on the point I made earlier. If you look at Matthew 28, verse 19, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the end. Discipleship. Discipleship. And I know that in our diocese, there's what you call ETS. I will want to plead that more emphasis should be given to parishes. After you do all the evangelism, those new faiths that come to the church, let's teach them. And they will now grow to begin to teach others. That is how we grow the church. Thank you. And finally. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Chidi Okachukwu of the Diocese of Lagos, Maryland. I'll make three recommendations on how possibly we can grow a congregation. Number one is to have an adequate management of our time during services. The generation that we are pastoring is in a crazy race against time. So if we're able to improve our time management, I believe very strongly that we'll grow a congregation. Number two, we need to improve on the content of our services. And if we're going to do that well, we have to understand the makeup of our congregation. Some congregations prefer evangelical 
and things like that, while others are liturgical, while the others are both congregational and liturgical. So whichever congregation you are pastoring, understand the makeup and improve the content of our services, both in preaching, in music, liturgy, and all that. Number three is youth involvement. The Anglican Church needs to find a way to involve the youth the more in our services. And I'm, I believe that if that is done, our congregation will grow. Thank you, sir. Please, if you have other steps we could take, you can write them down and send it to us. We'll compile a things to do and to be communicated to all dioceses. Thank you so much, and God bless you for the attention and contribution. Sir. We want to sincerely appreciate the Reverend Dr. Karo Benaka, who anchored the last session. Let us listen together. And we also appreciate all the contributors. We are rounding up. We have been talking about growing the church, the role of the clergy. Wherever there is human being, there are bound to be conflict, there are bound to be crisis. What you can only leave what you le where you left is files. I'm sure the files in our various offices since yesterday, if nobody touched them, in another six months, they will still be there. They will only gather dust. But even here, if you just look back, people may be tempted to go and pick one thing or the other. That is why we have marchers and people moving around to call them to order. So to look at this, we have invited one of our father, a crisis manager, and a man of many parts. To share this session, we have also invited one of us, the canon in residence of the Cathedral Church of St. Jude, Ebutemeta, in the Diocese of Lagos Mainland, Venerable Dr. Joe Isagara, is going to share this session while our resource person, the facilitator, is our referred father in God, the Lord Bishop of the Diocese of Awori, the Right Reverend Dr. Johnson Akinwamide Atere. Papa has arrived to time and is ready to deliver. Praise ye the Lord. That was too weak. We have been tired. And you expect your members to be alive even after preaching for two hours. And so, I think the anointing should start from you. Praise ye the Lord. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Our Father and our God, we cannot but continue to thank you for all the blessings we have received and for making this workshop possible again this year. Thank you for all those you have used 
to educate us from yesterday, even as we continue today. Lord, we invite you anew, even as we open our mouth to discuss the problems we have been experiencing in your church, even as a minister. We pray, O oh Lord, that you grant us the anointing of understanding. And give me your word now. In the name of Jesus Christ, I have prayed. Amen. Uh, you want to say something before I should continue? Okay. I want to appreciate the management of our seminary. I want to sincerely thank the Dean, the Right Reverend Dr. B.J. Adeyemi, and everyone who has been responsible for organizing this workshop again this year. And I want to also thank all of you who are here and those who might probably have left. This is the last lecture, and I consider it to be very essential. And it is only good that we pay attention to all that we are going to say. Very practical. And uh, I think I'm qualified to handle this topic because I've gone through it, and I'm still going through it. It's a practical thing that you cannot avoid. And that has to do with conflicts and crisis. And so the topic is handling conflicts and crisis in the ministry. And I have different types of definition. Conflicts and crises can be described as dramatic events or times of great chaos or danger. It is the presence of a difficult problem that is going through a period of anomaly. It is also a period that will lead to an unstable and dangerous situation affecting an individual, group, or society. It produces negative changes in the human or environmental affairs, especially when they occur abruptly with little or no warning. Why conflicts describes and interaction of friction and discord resulting from diverging insurmountable interest, crisis describe the apex of a conflict, sometimes leading to a dangerous escalation. Crisis could be political, financial, it could be family, it could be hair related. A period of great danger, difficulty or confusion, and when problems must be solved or important decision must be taken, then crisis arises. And crisis, like the coordinator have said, arises where human beings exist because of philosophical differences, divergent goals, or manage or poorly managed conflict leading to breakdown in trust and loss of confidence in leadership. Now, if we now zero it to the church and our ministry, our crises start from home. Some of us are having home crises between husband and wife, parents and children, between siblings, like we have Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau. We have between church members, vicars, and parish council, 
between bishop and priest, which I went through, between Archdeacon and his priests, between bishops, and probably a session of the diocese, or diocese and the community, between priest and priest, and between priest's wife and uh, another priest's wife. And so we are surrounded by crisis. And Jesus Christ warned his disciples that crisis and conflicts, even persecution, is a must. If you read Matthew chapter 10, verses 17 to 18, 21 to 22, 24, 38, and 39. Ali said, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to counsel and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Now, brother, we deliver up brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endured to the end will be saved. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So we can see Jesus telling the apostles that they should be ready to suffer persecution and other hazards in their work of evangelism. I remember James was beheaded through persecution. Peter was in prison pending execution. And Paul listed the various hazards he went through in his ministry, part of which is shipwrecks, arrests, persecutions, beating, chains, betrayal, and so on. And so ministry also brought hazards to our marriages and to our children, which also happened to the apostles who were married. In the Old Testament, the ministry brought hazard also to the children of Eli and Samuel because both of them were so preoccupied with the administration that they had no time to take care of the discipline and moral life of their children. Now, when you look at yourself and point the mirror to your life and to us as individuals. Many ministers today are becoming too tired of the ministry because of what they embattled and other things that are happening to them as a person and nobody wants to care Nobody wants to sympathize with you. And therefore, many of us are experiencing burnout and spiritual exhaustion, which are symptoms such as fatigue, loss of appetite, changing our sleeping patterns, spiritual doubt, and emotional withdrawal from community and family. Some of us are battling with their heads that church may not bother. When pastors are in a health, a healthy state, their family, their staff, the church are better set up to strive. But when they are distressed, their ministry is limited and everyone around them is affected. And if left unattended to these problems, can lead to pastors' burnout. 
Now, let me identify some of other crises we find ourselves. Now, the first thing I have here is the feeling of loneliness and isolation. Church leaders often feel alone and isolated. And feeling can be caused by unattainable pastoral assignment. When you are given an assignment and you are not able to accomplish it, then you feel lonely, you feel disappointed. Or lack of appropriation from the church staff. Your staff, the church staff, your wardings, when they refuse to appreciate your efforts, you get discouraged. Conflict with church members. I will soon come to that. Causes of crisis between the pastor and the congregation. We also have general lack of friends and peer network for support. Some of us, instead of seeing ourselves as colleagues, we see ourselves as enemies. You feel it's in a better place, and you, are, you feel that you are wrongly posted. Then instead of even directing your annoyance to he who posted you, then you begin to keep malice with your colleagues. Also, loneliness may come when you are naturally not friendly. We have some pastors, if you want to make friends with them, they rebuff you. And healthy activities and new friendship, some don't like. Just post me to a church, do my work. I don't want to see any other person. And such people, you attempt to make friends with them, they withdraw from you. And so the solution is that we should, as a pastor, know and understand what our pastoral duties are in the church. You cannot avoid relating to people. You can't. Relating with friends, even relating with the church. You must, even when they withdraw from you, when they run away from you, run after them. Because if you are not friendly with them, they may not listen to you. They may not even respect you. And you begin to build up enemies upon enemies for yourself. We have also political and cultural divisions. In a church, you have different divisions, either based on culture, tribes, or political affiliation. In some churches, you have PDP, you have uh, APC, you have all that. And some of them will walk along the group, either against the church or in the favor of the church. We have some of our even dioceses now that are divided simply because the pastor or the head of the diocese could not manage the division very well. Because as a pastor, you are every political party in your church, you belong to them. And if you choose not to belong to any, you don't belong to any. And the moment they discover that you have sympathy for any, because they are divided, then order will work against you. And from there, you begin to have problems. And so I want to advise the pastor to address even political issues from a biblical perspective. Rather than avoiding politics for the sake of discipleship, I'm proposing that we should try applying discipleship to our politics. And so by regularly teaching basic biblical principles, such as loving our neighbor, when you have a divided congregation, the best sermon that you can even divide into series is love. Let them see themselves 
as one in Christ. Pastors should provide guidance and have meaningful conversation about political and cultural issues. You must understand yourself that the standard of political leaders that we pray for should preoccupy your conversation, not identify anybody and recommending anybody. The crisis of the ministry to the marriage and children of a pastor. The home of a pastor should be a model in love, honesty, good behavior, generosity, cleanliness. The home of a pastor should showcase humility, respect. And so the pastor, his wife and children are like a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Therefore, the pastor and his wife should be example of chastity. Their marriage should be without blemish, and their children should be highly disciplined. However, the ministry brings various crises to homes and identifies just few. Now, in Anglican Church, even though it is true that the pastor should be ready to be sent anywhere for the work of evangelism. However, sometimes transfer and location of a priest can lead to the pastor living far away from his wife and his children. And this can create crisis to the marriage and the children of a pastor. What way? See, sometimes when you are posted and leaving your wife somewhere and your children, and you are posted to a far place, in most churches, we have some women, Yoruba, we call them Okotikos, those who are no longer in their matrimonial home, who are just in the church. And the moment they see any pastor living alone without his wife around, if such pastor is not disciplined or careful, it could be a lady, it could be a woman, starting from, ah, pastor, are you the one going to the kitchen? Can I come and assist you? Can I come and help you? Well, it's just for to come and uh, cook for me. Please, come. And before you know it, and by the time your wife now pay a visit and discover that there is another woman at home, you can see how the family will be hot. It also will affect our children. Sometimes when you live away from your children, the fatherly care. You see, when you leave your children only for women, they love the children. But you as a father, there is... There is a responsibility for you. And it happened to me when I was transferred to Vaini, Nakure. For more than six years, my wife was the only one taking care of my children. And these children, they would cry and cry. And each time I come to visit them in Lagos, whenever I'm going back, I dare not to inform them. I will wait until <laughs> they go to school before I can leave. Because they will cry. They needed me. And each time they are crying, I will also be crying. Because I know that there is no way their mother could be able to ordinarily stop that alone from the father. It's able to caution the children. And so when you are posted, that is the area sometimes posting and location or transfer can affect your father. It also affects children's education. They are in a school, all of a sudden, the transfer will come and they, they may not accept the children where you are going at that particular time. You have to waste their time, waste everything. And so only God help us to take care of our children. And so that is the area also that transfer can cause some crisis at home. 
Then transfer also can also cause crisis when you pastor a church that has some level of facilities. They have good vicarage, they have a bus, they, your allowance. I'm sure you take allowance from the church. Eh? It's illegal. <laughs> it's illegal. So maybe you are paying your stipend. But where I'm going is this. You are in a church where your monthly allowance is about 80000 apart from the stipend. And you are posted to another church where you needed to support the church instead of even taking from them. And you see, when you are well taken care of in the former church, you see, both your wife and your children will know that my father is working because you know how much you give as how keep. But now you have to sit your wife down, your children and say, well, we are in trouble, though. You may not, you may be able to cope, but your wife may not be able, especially when it's not, she's not working. Your children, you have put in a very good school because you have a standard and you are in a village, you are posted to somewhere where you cannot even afford to provide for your home. This also may cause crisis. You see, your wife may manage with you for sometimes, but he, being a woman, she might want to challenge you, why are you still in the ministry? And so pa pastors and his family, as they get to each new locations, determine whether there is crisis. And someone who, in a small church, who maybe his um, monthly allowance is about 20,000, and is now posted to the city church, where the first allowance is 80,000, then whatever crisis that is already established in that family, because there is now smile, then you now enjoy your family. And so what my suggestion is, wherever you find yourself, adapt. Because as an evangelist, as a missionary, you can be posted to anywhere. And that is why, for those of you who are not yet married, you must sit your fiancé, Sit her down. Let her know where you are going. Let her know the, the hazards of the work. Let her know that it is not for money making. That sometimes you may have enough. Sometimes you may not have enough. Let her understand. And those of us who are already married, we must also counsel members of our family that I am not in control of where I go. And so wherever we go, please let us adapt. And if they understand, then you will have or you will enjoy your family. And uh, even if you are a bachelor, sometimes crisis may come. You already have a very reasonable relationship almost, in fact, in some cases, you might be thinking of fixing the day of your marriage, and you are posted to a location or a church where you have so many ladies who are not yet married, and you just come. Ah, you have to be very careful, because except your fiancé has to leave whatever she's doing and come and rent a house. Not living with you, but already a house very close to you to monitor you. If not, the ladies of nowadays may snatch you. Because everybody is looking for where, in fact, it is, uh, it is the wish of every lady to get married to a pastor, especially Anglican uh -huh. for stability, because they know that you cannot divorce them by the 
virtue of your doctrine and uh, your tradition. You can't. The moment you are married to a lady, even if he packs a wave, she passes away from your house, as long as she's not married, or as long you don't have a divorce uh, certificate, even when he, she gives you a divorce certificate, you still need the approval of your bishop for you to marry. And therefore, they know this. And so if you're, if you're a bachelor in a church, you must be ready to be disciplined. Now, administrative and leadership crisis. The first thing I have here is arrogance. Some pastors are not humble enough to accommodate his members. Because in any church, we have individual differences. There are diversity and low capacities. Such so will not listen or take advice. Some of our pastors, they don't listen. They don't take advice. Advise them, this is not the road. This is not the way. No, they are very adamant. Very pompous. And some of our pastors feel superior in every situation and encounter. Living and acting above the people. You see, the way you minister somewhere like this cathedral is different from the way you will minister to the congregation at uh, who is calling a worry? Don't be silly. A worry is what's what's different between a worry and uh, and Ikeja. Don't 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 dare also. But what I'm saying is that, you oh, see the way your application, your English, your attitude to a congregation like this may be different from your attitude when you cross the water to where anything goes. And uh, sometimes even our application, for instance, well, you may use, if you want, members of this congregation to know or to understand your, maybe your sermon, you may borrow some Hebrew words some Greek words, and if you understand German, to establish yourself, they will understand. But go to somewhere over the sea, or uh, Bangkok, and begin to say, Konoil, what does it mean? Apa. Then by the time you, you finish, you say, Pastor, are you, have you finished? And so sometimes we want to show our ego and we preach above these people. And instead of them commending us, they may call crisis. And not only that, crisis between us based on, our lit on the liturgy or liturgy that we now borrowed can generate conflicts and crisis either between pastor and the church members. And this can be as a result of lack of ministerial training in responsible theological institutions. How many of you attend seminary? How many of you? There's only one seminary in Nigeria. Akure? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if any is at Akureo. Thank you, Jare. Now, what I'm saying is that if you are not trained, there are some of us who just, even though we are trained, we don't apply our training to the congregation. And so, lack of adequate knowledge of relevance. Do you know that all the subjects that you offered when you are in the training? They have a place in your ministry. They have a place in your ministry. Even Islamic studies have a place. Even ATR have a place. And so, for those of you who just had Bible study, and uh, because you know how to 
just lead the Bible study and you are ordained. You may not be able to manage the church as required. And therefore, you may cause crisis for yourself. Because there are some die-hard Anglican in your church. The moment you do anything contrary to what they believe in, they can cause trouble for you. And I think I had that experience when I got to have, I think I mentioned it last year, when during the crossover service, you know, in Anglican church, you know, how many of you are Yoruba here? You know, the moment, even before, after you have wished everybody Happy New Year, Happy New Year, the next thing is how are you? Oh, if you don't sing it where you have Anglican and you start doing anointing or whatever you want to do you are not going to enter that new year in peace and so we have this tradition that if you joke with it your art of worship is also essential and uh, a pastor not spiritually sound, his church will be deserted, and this will definitely affect his ability to fulfill some obligations. Lack of adequate knowledge of the world. When members are not being led to Christ by your ministration, or you are a copy and paste preacher, if you are not a teacher, but just a preacher, if you are not an evangelist, you are not a missionary, you are not mentoring people, you are not a mentor, you are not a counselor, you are not a pay setter, when you live or act below Christian expectation, you will have crisis. What about family life, which I've mentioned, I see mentioning here that if you are not showing a good example of a Christian home, some members may not want to associate with unloving home. No matter how eloquent a pastor is in preaching ideal home, they want it to start from that pastor. Crisis with the church. The church is a congregation of many diversity with different races, cultural differences, knowledge, different abilities, and different level of understanding. If the administrators of the church fail to manage this, may resort to crisis. We must therefore understand the needs of the moment. If you are not computer literate, you may misunderstand the enlightened session of the congregation. Wrong use of language, offensive attitude by the pastor or wife. You have some of our wives, you have some of us who are just too irrational. You don't know how to talk. And the moment you have that attitude, you may not have a peaceful congregation. Or your wife, sometimes you are good, you are sensible, you are loving. Your wife may be contrary. And so, because of your wife, they will cause trouble for you. Inability to listen to views of others. Lack of understanding of the attitude of members when a pastor is too official. You want to feel, ah, you have to come, you have to see my secretary, you have to fill a form, and the form will be taken to me in the office. If I want you to come in, that is when you come in. Official. Ah, you'll be alone. Because there is another pastor. They may not be Anglican who is accessible, who is willing to even take responsibility to go at any length with whoever needs their assistance or help. An impatient lack of courage. Some of us don't. We are not courageous. The moment anything happens, we are discouraged. And this may cause problem for us. Indecent, indecency in appearance. Wasteful. Some of us are just fearful, wasteful, wasting the church fund 
Some of us tell lies and live above our means. Laziness. Some of us are too worldly and carnal. Lack of integrity. Some have no focus or vision or goal. All this can cause crisis and conflicts. And financial crisis, the stipend of a pastor which you earn may be far from being sufficient to maintain yourself and your immediate family. Like I said before, the financial crisis is worse if a pastor has so many children. And the children may be sent away from school if you have too many. What is the ideal number of children for a pastor? Six. But it depends on you. But you dare not allow these children to waste their life. So you should be able to sit down with your wife and plan how many can we be able to raise to, a, to our own desire level. And so if you are a priest in Viney Cathedral and you have Six. Well, God may help you through the members to take care of them. But by the time you are posted with your wife and those six children to just give me a please. <laughs> Michael is still I, where you, where you pastor and the people will come. I remember when I started my ministry at the Kogazebe. That's that where I started. You see, instead of people giving you, they say, Oganda, uh, anything for us? So it is you who will also give. And so, and I think uh, one of my one of my curates had that problem. I won't mention the name. But when he got there, he was still living the way he used to live here. He used to drink beers. And whenever he visits any member, they know that our pastor um, loves to drink beer. So they will buy for him. And so when he got there, and nobody is buying it in, he resorted into Goguro from Goguro to... <laughs> and so that is why you have to plan your family and don't show more than you can buy it. The financial crisis may make also pastor to misbehave or be a beggar. See some pastors going about begging for money. Or by the time you get to that stage, you may be forced to dilute your message. You want to preach to or take care or pray only for the rich. In fact, some of us who call ourselves pastor, you are you 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 go out for pastoral visitation and you only identify some special homes. That does not. So by the time those who are not privileged and they now discover that you pay more attention to some privileged ones, then they will, they will take it up from, with you. And where a pastor is not very strong spiritually, the financial hazard may tempt him to collude with the wardens to mismanage or embezzle the church money or resort to any other financial malpractice. This is one of the easiest way to start a crisis in the church, especially during the vestry meeting. After the auditor will have uh, maybe presented the reports, and there is any information that the pastor have not been faithful with the account, you can see people from there. Trouble will start. I also believe that due to 
daily crowded programs of the pastor, he may have no time to attend to his health until disaster strike, and he end up in the hospital bed. And this will affect the pastor's finances. Because if you have to also finance your own um, treatment in the hospital, you will not be able. Because some pastors or some churches don't care. They only need your services. And the moment you are not providing it, for whatever reason, it does not concern them. And so that means that we must take time to rest. We must take time to rest. If God gives you the strength, please, no matter, even if you are iron, take time to sleep well at night. Some of us, well, it's good. Some of us are highly spiritual. You can go on 44 days fasting and prayer and vigils. Good luck for you. But you must also know that what you are using is not is, is, is body that is controlled. There's a system in our body. There's a system in our body. And uh, the same Jesus that sent you on this errand. Do you remember Jesus also? Occasionally, the Bible says we withdraw and go to the wilderness, a solitary place. <laughs> what has he gone there to do? To rest. In fact, God himself created this world. How many days? The seven days rested. And so if God can rest, I don't know, you may interpret to anything, but what the Bible says is rest. And so let us rest. Because the moment anything happens to you in the church, and you are no longer able to perform your ministerial duty. Before you know it, that Rabbi Joe, that person that you feel loves you, they will be the first person to approach the bishop and said, um, will you, we want our pastor to go and rest. They will not ask them or ask the bishop to take him away. What they are saying is that it is no longer useful. And that may cause crisis. You are not ready to retire. You are not yet 70. And so please take care of yourself. A pastor who remains faithful to the gospel and to his ministry will suffer insult. If you are very diligent, be ready to be persecuted. You will suffer insult. They will, the congregation will rise against you. Especially when you attack their sin. They won't, they won't find it easy and they will attack you, and they cause crisis for you. And I also have here crisis of retirement. The first crisis in retirement is where do you retire to? Or what, or what do you retire on? And the pastor in all his working career may not be able to put up, no matter how small, a place called house or home. And so the moment you are approaching 70 and there is nowhere to retire to, then that crisis will set in. I just want to pray that before you retire, you will have finished your retirement home in the name of Jesus Christ. They are not saying amen. Even if you already have one, there are still some people who have not had. So those people, I expect them to say a very big amen. I say, you will not retire to your family <laughs> from my house in the name of Jesus Christ. Then we also want to, as part of your retirement, see for now, I don't know how much pension that will be paid to you there will be no for you to take care of yourself. Especially in the country we find ourselves. And so there's also this problem, although thank God, because Anglican church, the moment you retire, you are sure of your pension to life. Can we celebrate Anglican church? Especially, especially the Supra Board West. But no matter how, 
In fact, do you know that there are some bishops, their pension is not up to 100,000. And yet, they already have a taste. And you also know that the moment you are getting older, especially when you are the, at a stage, part of your budget will be to take care of what? Of drugs. Of drugs. And that you cannot, you, can, you cannot help. And so, if that is also crisis, it's certainly a crisis, and yet your wife will eat, and God forbid, you still have children in the primary school or in the, in the secondary school at age 70, then the crisis will increase. Then your wife also, we also have the crisis of widowhood. Some pastors may die suddenly, either through sickness, through accident. We don't pray for it, but it does happen. And before you know it, the church cannot accommodate your wife at the maximum of uh, maybe, if they love you, maximum of maybe six months. And that is if the bishop have not posted someone to replace you. And so, where will your wife go? Where will happen to the children? This also will be crisis. And that is why whenever you are on duty, when you are working, don't eat with both hands. You must be ready to plan your life. Just plan. In fact, we are told that your retirement plan starts from when you are ordained. You begin to look towards retirement. Or if the unexpected happen, what becomes your family? And that is why also I believe that this is also crisis in our homes. Let me just quickly run through how to handle conflict. I still have, by the time you have a copy of uh, my work, you'll be able to sit down and eat and read and digest properly. The first thing I have here is as much as possible, it is better to prevent crisis. It is better to prevent it rather than uh, manage it. And you remember the story of uh, Isaac when he was digging wells. He dug it in a place. The husband came and fought him. Instead of exchanging battle with them, he went to another place until he went to the top place where peace was restored. And he named that place Rehoboth. And so, as much as possible, avoid crisis. If it takes that you should even be a, a no matter the, what they call you, as long as there is peace, please be ready to subject yourself to such suffering and my, my question here is, can we find an example in the church of Nigeria? Is it good to ask for divine wisdom to know when to claim rights and when to withdraw? Because some of our pastors will be claiming rights. It's my right. I am the pastor. I am the vicar of, uh, I'm the chairman of parish council. Whatever I say is the final. No, the moment is tending toward crisis. Whatever you say may no longer be final. Then learn to talk before you fight. Dialogue. Make sure you dialogue very well because what is rejected today may be the solution tomorrow. And I have here the story of uh, Jephthah. You remember Jephthah was, was rejected by even his siblings, his, his, his family, claiming that he is not a member of the family and he was sent away. But he sent away and God made him great. So much that those who rejected him now were looking for him. 
and he has to sit them down. Now you have sent me away. Now sit down. We want to discuss. Dialogue. And so the man who was sent away now became the head. And so it could be that if you know how to manage people. Pastors or church minister should be initiator, should be a peacemaker. And I have this example of uh, Abraham who all had a dispute with uh, Lot. What did he do? He asked Lot, even though he's the junior brother, he asked him, where, take where you prefer. And he released his authority and his right. And eventually, today, Abraham is the father of all of us. And his examples show how to respond to difficult family crisis, situation and crisis between vicar and curate. You see, there's always a crisis between vicar and curate. But either of the two should be able to sacrifice, especially the vicar. Or could it be adjacents and other priests, priests and members of the church, family peace and peace among brothers should be above personal desire. When you have your own desire, you have to wait. If I pursue my desire, will it end in crisis or will it solve the problems? If you want to ignite the crisis or you want to put fire on the crisis, then please take it as part of your sacrifice as a man of God. So a minister should be a peacemaker. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called son of God. So, if you analyze crisis before you dab into any, or you are invited to solve any problems, you must take time to analyze. You must study. You must, you must know. You must have adequate knowledge of the situation so that whatever statement you make, may not aggravate the crisis. Rather, should solve the problems. A minister should commit crisis into the hands of God through prayer. If you read Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20, it says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him. He gave us the, the guidelines on how to solve crisis from verses 15 to 20. In fact, in verse 17, he said, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. It then means that the church should be the, the court of appeal. You know, you have the lower court. The lower court is, uh, what's the name of the lower court? No, okay. From magistrate, you go to high court. Okay, from okay, start from high court. High court. So court of appeal. The church should be the court of appeal. The Supreme Court. Huh? The Supreme Court will now be. Hey, leave God. Leave God for that. Leave God with joy where you pray. But the Supreme Court of Anglican Church in your diocese, where is the Supreme Court? And that's why it's called Bishop's God. So any crisis cause initiated in the diocese should be able to end at Bishop's God. And whatever is decided there should be agreeable to all. And so the guidelines are for crisis management in the church. I want you to get that because of time. That's why I've not... Um, ask us to read. But please note it that Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 to 20 is the guideline. God, and if you read verse 18, refer to the decision of the church on a crisis. Now, let me just rush. Now, be, out, be firm and be bold. If you are not firm as a pastor, then you may not be able to solve some problem. 
affirm all that is good in a matter. Everything that is good in that matter. By the time you listen carefully, then you have to analyze and affirm which one is true, which one is likely to be false. Then analyze it because 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 says, Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulations. And so you must be bold. Let, let, let people not see you as a coward pastor. No. When you need to affirm your authority, affirm it in line with the gospel, in line with the word of God, and in line with the constitution of your diocese. And be accurate and honest. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, and chapter 8, verse 21. Be accurate and be honest. Don't be dis don't, don't play hanky-panky. Don't, don't tend towards a side that may likely be falsehood. And so that is why you ask for the wisdom of God before you double into any situation. A pastor should be gentle after being firm. Yes, be firm, but do it with all humility. Be gentle. Don't be arrogant. It's part of the discipline that a pastor should imbibe. A pastor should use discipline when other methods fail. That we have said, um, when all other method fail then but when you rebuke rebuke to discipline not to hurt rebuke to discipline you have that right as given to you or as suggested by Paul to Timothy and as much as possible Christians should not take their disagreement to law court and this is for the generality of the church if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 Verses 1 to 6 said, Dear any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saint will judge the word and so on? And my comment is that for Christians, the church is the final court of appeal. And by church, I mean the leadership of the church. If the judge in the secular court is not a Christian, he is not likely to be sensitive to your Christian principle and values. And the basis for going to court is often revenge, which is not a Christian value. Lawsuits make the church look bad, causing unbelievers to focus on the problems rather than on the purpose. And so a minister should recognize his contribution in the crisis. This is another way of solving problem of crisis. What is your own contribution towards that crisis? Yes, it is true. Oh, he has done this. He has done that. He has done this. He has done that. What is your own contribution? Why do you contribute? You must first of all remove the log in your eyes before helping others to remove the sprite in their eyes. And so, um, in managing crisis, we should also consider James chapter 4, verses uh, 7 to 12. And I want to read. He said, Therefore, submit to God. Receive the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. You sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother, Speak evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, 
You are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? And so, according to this, selfishness is the cause of some of the crises. And to resolve the crisis, we should judge ourselves. What is the motive of that crisis? What is your own motive in that crisis? And I say, turn away from all physical and spiritual adultery and humbly entreat God's grace. Submit to God. Resist the devil and repent of all sins. Stop judging others and submit to God. And in managing crisis, pastor must also recognize that they are leaders and must work as leaders. God calls us church leaders, call us elders, call us overseer, call us pastor. And so church leaders are also called, prohibit them, that is to stand before, that is to have charge over. You are in charge. It means to rule over. And so we have to see ourselves as leaders. And so whatever happens to the church, whatever happens in our home, whatever happens even to the diocese, must be traceable to the leader. And so whatever might be your contribution, you must know it and talk to yourself. Pastors are required to work personally with God. Paul exhorted Timothy, his younger co-worker, to pay attention to himself and to his teachings. We have to pay attention to ourselves. What is our problem? Why is our church not having peace? Like I said, what is our contribution? What do we ought to do and we fail to do? And uh, we have to maintain a good conscience before God and others. The Bible says in Acts chapter 24, verse 16, This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offensing towards God and men. Some of us, we don't have conscience. We, we, we the word, I, I, want, I don't want to use the word wickedness. But if you have conscience, you will know that that your attitude may probably cause harm to your neighbor or to the church or to someone. So we must renew our conscience. We must ask God to anoint our conscience so that we can think rightly and do what is right. Church leaders must live with a view of asking to God. You must live your life and know that a day will come when you will give account. Account of what God... So the, you are also going to give account of the crisis that you caused in the church of God. The crisis that you initiated in the church of God. You are going to give account. Don't forget that we are just on that shepherd. Who is the shepherd? Who is the great shepherd? Am I talking to... Huh? You are on the shepherd, walking under the great shepherd. And a day will come when the shepherd, the great shepherd will ask, what have you done with the opportunity I gave to you? Church leaders should be men of faith and prayers. You must encourage others. You see, there is just nothing God cannot do. Even Nigeria has insecure as we are today, if all the saints, if all of us can sacrifice and pray to God, I am sure peace will be restored. And so the church is not a business enterprise which think of profit all alone. Our aim as a church leader is not only to lead by collective wisdom, but to depend on God. Yes, we can come as a diocese. We can come as parish council. Your counselors may advise you on where to go, but they are not as perfect as God. So as much as possible, bring people together and cry unto God. Even if you are experiencing crisis now, either in your home or in the church, even in the diocese, 
Why can't we come together? Why can't all the archdeacons, why can't all the priests come together and go to the bishop and say, my Lord, we want to pray. And if there is any crisis in any church, in any archdeacony, in the life of any pastor, you see, the problem we also have in Anglican church, or when it's not in Anglican church, it's cut across, is that when a pastor is in crisis, when he's having problem, instead of all of us to rally around, to pray with him, to support him, to see how we can bail him out, then he becomes the subject of ridicule in our camp. That is very wrong. Pastors, therefore, we should pray. Pastors as church leaders should be willing to suffer for Christ. And that is what 2 Timothy 1, 8. Paul advised Timothy, Therefore, be not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or me, his prisoner. That is, be ready. I've said it. Be ready to take insult. Be ready to suffer just to keep the church together. And even in your family, between you and your wife, yes, you are the head of the family. But if that family, if your ministry is destroyed, you are going to be the first casualty. Your wife can decide to go and marry another person. It's possible. And so you should not allow your ministry to have crisis. Because if you are a pastor that always report crisis to your bishop, you may not go far. And some of us, even when you are you are you have crisis and that crisis you have no hand in that crisis maybe it is by the attack from the devil you must pray because you may not have a bishop that will understand your situation church leaders should work together and this i mentioned i want to repeat it we must work together you see, we must make friends. One of the purpose of this workshop is to make friends, is to know others. This is our constituency. This is our party. We should not hate ourselves. Whatever you do, you will discover that your colleagues are more represented than even the lady. The lady you are talking about, the moment you are posted out of a certain church, they may forget you. Until when they see you, ah, and I wanted to call you, hey, I just want to call you now, it's a lie. And so, we, 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 we here, those of you from my worry, at least you'll be able to make at least 10 friends across, uh, across, I know, to me, I believe that even if you have your leave, you want to spend your leave. Why can't you just call a friend? Okay, I'm coming to spend two days with you. Then from there, you go to another friend. I know that some of you go to America or go to Britain. But those of you who have no means of uh, ever going to or travel to Ibadan, why can't you cement the friendship? And so, those of you who are from Awori, when you get back home, give me the list of your new friends so that I can help you to contact them. It's, it's just, I'm just telling you the truth. We have to be together. And those of you who work together, all the Ardekins, some of us, we are enemies of ourselves. We are enemies of ourselves. I say, as an Ardekin, at least the next post is uh, eh? If God, yes, if God permits. But at least at the level which your bishop can take you is the level of an Ajikin. Why can't all Ajikin be together? Why can't we love one another? Why can't we help our bishop so that we can establish? In fact, we can. This is one of the reasons why I feel that Lagos Metropolitan Diocese is. Uh, we are, we, are, we are fulfilling God's purpose and God's injunction. 
bringing us together. And we also have a level of all the province share priests coming together. Now, by August, all the Church of Nigeria priests, we are coming together. These are avenues for us to come together. And so please don't hate yourself. You who, you who is in a privileged church today, don't be too happy. Tomorrow, you may be begging. I remember someone who, who pastor a church where there was a, a boss. Each time he's going for a meeting, his colleagues, we ask him, please help us. I would say, no, 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 no. No, no. Eventually, his bishop got to know. And he was posted to where there is no vicarage. Oh, and the man whom he refused to assist, he was not even posted to replace him. So you can see, in Anglican church, there is no permanent post. There must be permanent relationship. And the Decalogue is summed up in love. And that is the greatest that I want to communicate to you. Every crisis will end if there is a show of love. A minister should help members of the church. Help your members to grow. Help your members to be together. Obey. Help them to teach them to obey the leadership of the church. Don't join them to accuse the bishop. Don't join them to accuse the leadership of the church. Through that, you may cause problems for yourself. You may cause crisis for yourself. And by faithfully teaching them the word of God, very, very essential, the undiluted word of God. So when you are teaching your members, and they are not following you. You don't teach them. They don't, they don't know the gospel. They don't know the word. They will cause problem for you. They will cause problem for you. And so, if you want to prevent crisis, teach them the word of God. Teach them love. Teach them how to relate with one another. Teach them how to take care of one another. Let them know that they are responsibility to one another. Let those who are Privileged, those who are favored among them, know that they are favored because of the underprivileged. If you teach them, you also will enjoy. And finally, we have to emphasize God's grace rather than law. Let them know that it is by grace that they live every day. It is by grace that they are Christians. And therefore, they should appreciate this grace and not to turn it into anything that will get God's anoint. That God will be sorry for creating us. And so I think we should know this, that the grace of God is given so that we may enjoy our fellowship, enjoy ourselves. And that whatever takes you higher than any other person is just the level of grace. And the owner of that grace may withdraw it anytime if you take him for granted. And Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared, to all men, teaching us that deny ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Conclusion. Crisis will surely arise when and where people interact and worship together. It is therefore not unusual that there are crises in many dioceses and parishes. But crisis should not linger on for too long. The bishop should be the final court of appeal. And where bishops are involved, the primate should be the final arbiter. 
I humbly submit that church matters should no longer be taken to civil courts, if possible. And we are some are already in civil courts, they should be withdrawn. The province or the national church should set them to the glory of God. Thank you. Can we appreciate our Lord Bishop the ball? Put your hands together. Please be seated. Thank you, my Lord Bishop, for that wonderful expose. If we begin to review the presentation of my Lord Bishop, we can be here for hours on end because he didn't just give us a, a lecture. He gave us about two textbooks in one. And um, these are textbooks that are born out of personal experience. Crisis and conflict in ministry, the causes, and uh, he traced it beyond the horizon of what happens just in the church. Looking at the family, looking at the society, looking at the social structures and many others. Thank you, my Lord Bishop, erudite, highly gifted, highly skilled, theologian, teacher, superlatively different. Thank you very much. You have really blessed us so much. Beloved people of God, Bishop Atere, in making this presentation, I cast my mind back to so many years ago when he was moved from BAM Church to the teacher at the theological seminary. Many people would have been discouraged because BAM in those days was very rosy. And uh, he had to go to teach under the conditions at the college. But to God be the glory, he went there and came back in flying colors. Please put your hands together for him. The joy of listening to his lecture today is that he hasn't just postulated theories. He has only explained to us the way he has run his ministry. And I think that if we listen to him and apply this, it will be excellent. It will help us to be able to steer our own ministerial ship the right way. Like I said, I cannot start recasting or rehearsing what he has said. I know that he tried as much as possible to simplify the terms and we are all aware. So what we will do now is to ask whether there are some people who need clarification. He has raised many German issues. We cannot afford to take all the questions or all the contributions, but based on the fact that this is very, very vital, what we'll do is each row, one, two, three, four, we'll take two parole because it is very very important when we take the two please limit your question to the time limit which doesn't go beyond one minute comprehend it compress it and let it be that way so let me try to give number venerable man so it's number one who else on this line is there any other person on this line okay yes there's somebody the person there ahead towards the entrance door, that's number two. Can we come to this side? Anybody here? Well, this opportunity doesn't come every day. So since there is nobody there, your habitation will not become less desolate, but others will take your slot. So, Brebru <laughs> here is taken up as number three. Who else along this line? Is there any other person? All correct. Don't say all correct. Let's ask a question. Yes, sir. You're number four. Is there any other person there? I guess we'll take the four. So let's ask Venerable Man so to throw the first shot. Thank you, my Lord, for 
a well prepared and well delivered down to earth practical lecture. Now, my just two issues one on transfer. I love the way you mention what crisis may arise when, especially, a, a preschool is moved and the children are in one class moving to another class, and maybe he just pays school fee and they have to move to a distant station. And in most cases, they may not get class for such a uh, uh, Now, how does a priest cope in that aspect? Not just if we answer this question, I'm just throwing it. If there can be forum, I know there is forum for the College of Bishops, if they we always consider the children before movements of uh, priests, that's one. The second thing is on divorce of uh, marriage between, uh, like uh, you mentioned, those who will want to marry a pastor because there won't be room for divorce. Uh, a case happened some years back, even with this, uh, uh, with Baba Adimawa then, one of the clergy, the wife was misbehaving and nagging. Then the bishop has to call and say, you better let your sense calm down. If they say, please don't divorce, please don't divorce, say, I will give prerogative to your husband and he will divorce you. So that prerogative, is it by the 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 the, 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 the by law or by canon law of the church or by the bishop? Can can bishop can can it be made open so that most of priests that are suffering silently and in the hands of their wives and they do anything, can they make it open and let them know that look, this man also have the right to. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Number two. Please give. Yes, number two. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. As venerable, okay, if you want. Okay, 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 that's yes. right. Uh, my lord, my lord, I thank you very much for that uh, very wonderful paper. Quite erudite, and I think it should be a book. Because the issue of conflict between or amongst the clergy is one big elephant in the room that nobody seems to be willing to address. Uh, vicar versus assistant priest, uh, assistant priest versus junior assistant priest. These are real issues. Sometimes we run away from them. But I think the, the paper you gave really dealt quite deeply into that. And I want to recommend that your paper should be turned into some kind of uh, manual, at least if not a book. And having said that, I have a number of issues I want you to help us clarify. Um, the first one is on the issue of the liberty that the wife enjoys. I think that uh, a number of wives are aware of this inherent advantage. And so sometimes they overmine it, overexploit it. Um, I have been in marriage counseling long before I became a priest. And I know a lot of wives do take unnecessary advantage of this natural advantage. And it seems to me that you are fathers in the Lord may not be helping much. Sometimes when a priest has a conflict with his wife, um, you find out that the bishops, I'm sorry, the bishops tend to side with the wives. I don't know why. And I'm not sure it's helping matters, no matter how strong the case of the husband may be. Uh, so I, I think uh, we need to deal with that a lot more objectively. Um, the other issue is the issue of adapting to environment. Sometimes we refer to it as switching. Uh, a priest may be pastoring a church where the people are reasonably well-educated, and suddenly the bishop posts him to a place that is 
um, run down a place where they hardly understand good English. And that priest, I don't think there is anything in our training that uh, equips us, you know, to do what we call switching. We need to be able to switch. A priest should be able to switch. It doesn't matter what environment he finds himself. If he's um, in an environment where people are not well educated, he should be able to adjust so that he can communicate effectively. The whole essence of pastoring is to be able to communicate with the, the, the congregation and make impact. And so I think that's an issue that uh, we should pay more attention to in, uh, um, in uh, theological formation. When people are in school, I think we need to develop the syllabus in such a way that people should be able to understand what it means to serve in diverse environments. All environments are not the same thing. I pastored a number of churches and I discovered that each one is peculiar to its you know, environment and then you need to adapt yourself to those challenges. Uh, finally, sir, um, I also want to uh, refer to your talk about, yes, the attitude of clergy towards clergy crisis. I think it's rather lamentable. Sometimes we don't see that compassion. We don't see that empathy. Uh, what we see is uh, gloating, some kind of. And that's, that has made life more difficult for clergymen. When a clergyman is going through a crisis, you find that he doesn't have confidence among his fellow clergy. Rather, he will go outside and begin to share his intimate problems with other people. Whereas, it should have been the other way around. A clergyman should be a father, a pastor, who should be able to be a burden bearer. And But we find, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So I think uh, we need to address some of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Venerable Okay, if you know. The church is the only army that shoots her wounded generals. That's what we are putting forward. Let's go to the third person. It's at the back, not there. Number three is down there. Excuse me. That was a mistake. There's somebody right there at the back. Right there at the back. Before we come to you, so you are number four. Right there at the back. Okay, you transfer to your... Okay, you came forward. I didn't know now. I saw him there. Okay, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> this one is a storm in a teacup. Thank you, sir. Um, my Lord, I cannot but thank you on your cerebral lecture. And I pray that God will continue to strengthen you, sir. My challenge is 1 Samuel chapter 18. After David finished killing Goliath, as they were coming back, the women began to sing that David killed 10,000 while Saul killed 1,000. As a result of that, in fact, that was the seed of this cult planted. As a metaphor in the church, how can you counsel the women, David, and Saul? How can you advise the women, David, and King Saul? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Number four. Thank you, my lord. I want to stand on the... Please identify yourself, sir. My name is Femi Afolayo from Lagos, Mainland. Um, on the issue of pastors begging, please, sir, I need you to explain further. Because the question I ask is... Is it possible or is there any way that an Anglican priest will not beg? Not necessarily for himself or for his or uh, his own personal needs, but probably for the church. Because most of the time we lay emphasis on Anglicans begging, I mean priests begging. Uh, is, how would they do it if they don't beg? That's my concern, sir. So I need more clarity 
on that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we are through with the four that we approved. So we'll ask our request our Lord Bishop to please. Well, the first question has to do with uh, crisis caused by transfer and how can uh, a priest cope when he suddenly transferred and uh, maybe he has even paid the school fees of his children when suddenly he's transferred. I think it is now that we started having this type of problems. In the good old days, one, the priest children will attend the missionary school. And 